Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Little Dudes Insect Academy podcast. I'm so excited to be here with uh, my new friend, Emily. Um, I'm so excited to have her on the show. So uh, without further ado, welcome to the show. Emily, go ahead and introduce yourself for us. Hi, thanks for having me on the show today. It's very exciting to be here. So my name is Emily Strockoff. Um, I currently work at Penn State University. Um, with Penn State Extension. And what I specifically do there is I'm an extension specialist who focuses on vector-borne diseases. So those are diseases that are caused by arthropods like ticks and mosquitoes. And my work that I'm doing now is a lot of education and outreach. So I travel around the state of Pennsylvania teaching people about ticks and mosquitoes, what they are, what diseases they can carry, and then how to protect yourself from them. Amazing. Yeah. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. But um, yeah, we've talked about vector borne disease uh, quite a bit on the show in the past. So um, I'm super excited to see what you've been working on as well. But um, yeah, so first of all, let's go into your schooling. Um, where did you go to school? Where are you in that journey so far? And how has that kind of gone for you? And what have you worked on? Yeah, so I've been I've done a bunch of different things and different, you know, times in my schooling. Um, when I first started off school, I did not think I was going to be an entomologist. I did not have plans necessarily to go into entomology. Um, I was actually pre-med a long, long time ago at the start of my schooling. Okay. Um, but I eventually decided that I wanted to do something in the environmental field. Wasn't really sure what. Got my bachelor's of science in biology from St. Louis University in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, And then after that, I just so happened to get a job working at the St. Louis Zoo on their American Bering Beetle Conservation Program. Very cool. Yeah. So the St. Louis Zoo, they have what's called the Wild Care Institute, which is basically all of their conservation programs that they work on. And one of them is focused on the is focused on the American Bering Beetle, which is this carrion beetle. It's the largest carrion beetle you have in North America. They're Mm. they're very pretty beetles, really. They're red and black. They have spots on it. They're very cool. Um, And they have a population going out in Southwest Missouri, where my job for the time that I worked there was monitoring that population. So seeing what beetles are there, which ones aren't, um, doing surveys of other carrying beetles that were there, um, and then also helping to reintroduce these beetles because they were at the time an endangered species. Um, They've been extirpated throughout much of their current range. You can really only find them in a few states now. Mm. Um, So part of my job was, you know, doing these surveys and doing these introductions. And that's where I really got introduced to entomology and started really, you know, fell in love with the field. Awesome, yeah. So um, talk a little bit more about what you've been doing more recently um, at Penn State, I think you said, right? Yes, yes. Awesome. Yeah. So after I had yeah worked with beetles in uh, Missouri for a while, um, I did switch gears then into vector borne disease. I got my master's in entomology nice. at the University of Illinois studying ticks. Nice. And then after that is when I ended up out here in Pennsylvania, specifically working with ticks and mosquitoes. Nice. So, yeah. Nice. Yeah. So uh, while at Illinois, where uh, what were some of the things you worked? You said ticks, but uh, what were some of those things that you found with your master's? Yeah, so I did a few, I worked on a couple of different areas with ticks throughout my master's. One of the big things I did was I worked on Illinois statewide surveillance program for ticks. Oh, nice. So what that basically means is I would go out throughout the states, go to state parks, forests, prairies, all sorts of areas, collect ticks, and then we bring them back to the lab to test them for various different bacteria and viruses. Um, That was part of my master's. The other part of my master's was actually working in the insect collection at the University of Illinois. Oh, cool. Uh, The University of Illinois has a really awesome insect collection. And what I was doing was I was going through all of their historical ticks that they had. Mm. So all the ticks that had been deposited in that collection over the past, you know, 100 years Mm -hmm. and identifying them, seeing what they were and using that information to put together a list of, you know, what species were present in the state, where had they been found and what animals were those ticks feeding on. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, really important work, obviously. Um, yeah. So how about recently, uh, like uh, right now, what are you working on? Yes. So right now, like I said, a lot of what I do is education and outreach focused, teaching yeah. people about ticks and mosquitoes. So that can be, you know, sometimes to the gen- general public. I'll go out to fairs. We'll do presentations, um, creating uh videos and articles and things online for people to look at. Mm -hmm. Um, That also includes work 
working with like more specific groups. So for example, doing outreach with veterinarians. I've done a lot of work with veterinarians and vet techs, mm. um, teaching them how to identify different kinds of ticks and what to do if a dog comes into a clinic with a lot of ticks on it, mm. what steps do you take there? Um, I've also done work with some other groups, done a lot of work with horse owners, uh, folks who work in pest control, nice. um, all sorts of people. It's a, it's a very, very job. Yeah. I do a lot. Um, yeah, I do. I help out with some research projects here and there as well. So it's, it's a little bit of everything. Um, very cool. people, yeah, at Penn State, they described my job as like, if something comes up with vector borne disease and you don't know necessarily who to go to at Penn State about it, like, come talk to me and Amazing. then we'll figure out what we're doing. <laughs> Amazing. So cool. Yeah. So um, like, why is this such a dang- like important and dangerous thing to uh, learn about? Like, uh, give us sort of your elevator pitch on vector borne disease and why it's so important to know about. Yes. So one, so one thing is that vector borne diseases are becoming more and more common over time. You know, mm. in the past couple of decades, we've seen a very large increase both in the number of cases of vector-borne diseases that are appearing and then also the different kinds of vector-borne diseases that we have. Um, In Pennsylvania specifically, where I am now, um, Pennsylvania very consistently ranks number one in the United States in number of Lyme disease cases per year. Um, Yes. So Lyme disease is by far the most common tick-borne disease that you have Mm. in the United States. Um, There's it can cause a lot of symptoms, a lot of variety of symptoms, and it can really impact people's lives. Mm-hmm. Um, so especially where I am now in the Northeast, educating people about the disease, how to recognize it, and really most importantly, just like how to prevent tick bites in the first place mm. is very, very important. Right. Yeah. And so you see these things show up in not only humans, but also all kinds of other animals, like you mentioned, dogs. Um what are some of the treatments for, and I guess you're not a, a medical professional, but um, like what are some of these things that they're using to um, sort of either prevent or treat these things when they do happen? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. And like you said, yes, I, I am an entomologist by yeah. trade. I'm not a veterinarian or mm-hmm. a medical doctor or anything. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it, it really depends um, on what the animal is, you know, there's going to be different treatments, different ways to protect different animals, right? Right. The treatment for a dog isn't going to be the same as for a cat or Mm -hmm. for your horse. Um, And it depends also a little bit on where you are and what ticks you have in the area. Mm. Um, So for example, one thing that we've been keeping an eye on here at Pennsylvania is the Asian longhorn tick. Um, I don't know how familiar you are with the Asian longhorn tick or if you've heard about it before. I've heard about it, Uh, yeah. You've heard about before. Yeah, I, mm. I saw you nodding. It's just like, yeah. Um, so the Asian longhorn tick, yeah, it's an invasive tick species in the United States, um, has been found in, I'm not sure how many, I believe 19 states at this point it has been found in. Mm. Um, and it is especially common along sort of the Appalachian Mountain Range, Virginia, and we're starting to see it more and more in Pennsylvania. Um, okay. And the reason I bring it up is because it can cause disease in cattle. So being aware of where different tick species are, like, for example, if is the Asian longhorn tick in the area where you might have your cattle? Right. Having that information is really important when you're thinking about what steps do you need to take to prevent, you know, tick bites or tick-borne disease? What can mm-hmm. you do about it? What preventative options can you take, like you just mentioned? Yeah. Um, understanding the tick is very important to all of that. Yeah, for sure. And so, you know, it's not just studying the disease. It's also studying the vector itself, right? The, the, um, animal that transfers it such as the tick. So, uh, what, so when you're working with vector borne disease, do you, um, do people like you just study a specific vector borne disease or do you study, um, like, um, do you primarily work with Lyme disease or is it sort of just all the diseases that can be transferred through ticks? Yeah, I would say to that, it really depends on the per- the person, right? Mm-hmm. There's a lot of work to be done in the vector-borne disease field for sure. Right. And so there are some people who do really specialize in on, you know, one tick species, one disease. Mm-hmm. Um, my role as it is now is very general, just because I have to be prepared to answer questions about yeah. 
any of the disease that someone might have yeah. or might be worried about. Um, I remember I did one media interview at one point and it was a live media interview mm. and they asked me a question about Chagas disease. And yeah. I was like, wait, what? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> It's not something I'm used to answering questions about, you know, up in the Northeast here in the United States. Yeah. Um, so for my role, I'm, I'm much more of a generalist mm. in that regards, but folks do and can very much specialize in their field as well. Yeah. And so, um, yeah. Okay. So more generally focused on Pennsylvania. Um, yeah, very cool. Um, yeah, very, very awesome. Yeah. So moving on to a little bit more about you, Emily, um, who kind of got you, um, sort of, who sort of inspires you and who has kind of walked along you along with you with this, whether it's a mentor or um, a professor or something, or like, who do you look up to? And even somebody that might not even know you, like, um, uh, you know, a scientist uh, out there who maybe inspired you to get more into this. Yeah. So I'll say, I'll, I'll give you two answers there. One's very general and then one more specific. Mm -hmm. So, very generally, I'd say, especially now, like in my career, right. um, I'm just very inspired by not necessarily one person specifically, but seeing people in the field, like other people who are early in their careers, seeing all the really awesome science that they're doing, mm -hmm. hearing about the work that folks are doing, um, seeing what other people in extension are doing and how they're reaching out and yeah. doing scientific outreach is very inspiring. It's not necessarily one specific person, but seeing yeah. all the cool things that everyone is doing right. is so awesome. And I love it so much. Um, the other more specific thing I'd say in terms of who inspired me to go more into science, mm -hmm. um, we'll go throw it back to like my high school biology teacher. Yeah. I had a really awesome high school biology teacher. Uh, she was not an entomologist. She was a botanist. Um, she That's used awesome. to do a lot of botany stuff before um, she began teaching high school science, but she was the best. She was amazing. I remember I went to a very, very small high school and mm -hmm. I remember at one point the biology class that I was in, because I love bio and I wanted to do it more, yeah. um, it was going to be canceled because there was only like three kids who were signed up for it because mm. the school was just, it was tiny. We didn't have that many people who were interested in, you know, yeah. biology beyond, you know, those first initial classes or really just many students at all. I remember she fought for it and she had the class and just her and her support um, back, you know, when I was like a little high schooler who didn't really know what I wanted to do, mm -hmm. um, was very inspiring. And it was one of the things that kind of pushed me and inspired me to go into more scientific field. That's awesome. Yeah. Any, anybody else that we missed there or, um, yeah, again, it, like you said, it can just be the scientific, uh, world in general. Like you said, a lot of people just say, um, you know, like how inspiring entomologists are in general, um, super interesting say... people too. Yeah. Yeah, entomologists in general are all that, that's a very good answer as well. Cause entomologists, mm -hmm. I have found they are such like they are such an enthusiastic group oh, yeah. about what they study. Like entomologists love talking entomology. For sure. Um, and they're so supportive and people work on such cool things. You know, there's such variation in the field with what people do. Yeah. But yeah, I'd say the entomology community especially is very welcoming, welcoming, and it's a very fun group to be a part of. Yeah, for sure. I totally agree with you. And um, yeah, moving on. So uh, what are some other like activities and hobbies that you enjoy in your spare time, either related or not to entomology? Um, yeah. So what are some other hobbies and activities that you enjoy? Yeah, so I do read a lot. I'm a reader. I'm nice. a big sci-fi person. So any kind of yeah, sci-fi books, movies, love, always enjoy that. Nice. Um, I also like embroidering a lot. Okay. Um, I do a little bit of embroidering. I, I have done some tick and mosquito <laughs> pieces nice. as well. I feel like you have I feel to. like when you're a yeah. scientist and you do art, you have to make your your study organism. You have so to. Yep. I've done a little bit of that, um, which is fun. I enjoy it. It's relaxing. It's you know creative outlets, um, which is great. Uh, and then I also hang out with my cat a lot. Nice. <laughs> I have a cat. Her name is Nova. She's the sweetest. So, yeah. Those are, yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. So, um, okay. So, uh, moving on to your future, uh, what do you have planned? Are you thinking about maybe, uh, continuing school PhD, maybe who knows, um, what are your big plans for the future? Any projects or trips you want to go on as well? Um, what are your big plans? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, for the future, 
Um, I've thought about going back to school, not fully decided one way or another what's happened yeah. with the PhD yet. Um, but some projects that um, I have been working on more recently and will be coming up um, is we start to do more work with um, looking at scientific communication from the more communications standpoint. So, mm -hmm. you know, th looking at things like how best do students learn, how how best do can you communicate information and teach um, more of that social science work I've gotten more involved yeah. with recently, mm -hmm. um, which is going to be very fun to see how that develops as we start working on those projects more. Um, and that'll all specifically be aimed at ticks and mosquitoes and vector-borne disease as well. So what are the best ways to communicate that information to people um, is a kind of a large part of some upcoming projects we have, um, which will be very exciting to do. Um, but other than that, a lot of what I'll be doing will be, you know, still here at Penn State, still here in Pennsylvania, continuing to do all of this, you know, scientific outreach work. Yeah, very cool. Very, very big, exciting stuff. Yeah. And keeping your options open is also uh, really important as well. So I love to hear that. Um, yeah. So lastly, before we sort of wrap this up um, here, where can we go to learn more about you and the work that you've done? Maybe um, your lab's website, maybe your social media, if you have them. Uh, where can we go to learn more about you? Yeah. So I'll, so I'll start with um, for... Penn State. So to see a lot of like the extension -y stuff that I've been talking about, yep. um, we do have a website. It's extension.psc.edu. So all that information can all be found there. Cool. Um, for social media, I do have a Twitter. I'm afraid I have not been active on it in uh, in a little bit, but I'm mm -hmm. hoping to revive that Twitter soon. Cool. Um, but you can find me on Twitter um, at M E M Struckoff. Uh, so just E M and then my last name Struckoff. Nice. Um, I do have a Twitter. Awesome. And um, I will leave both of those links in the show notes as well as this episode so you guys can just click on that. All right, um, Emily, thank you so much for being on the show. This was super, super fun. Um, always love learning about vector-borne disease. It's just fascinating to me and super uh, important and valuable work. Um, so thank you for being on the show with me. Uh, super fun to get to know you. So thanks again. Yeah, thanks for having me on.